Hey everyone, today I wanted to walk through a, a short guide of how the sequence node works. This will be a deep dive into how this operates um, based on a lot of experimentation I've done while working on my own effects. Um, so everything I'm about to show you, you can learn yourself just by playing with the graph. Um, so each of the nodes in the node graph basically will operate when it's called by one of these green triggers. So notice the update node, this is an event node. This is where the initial triggers come from. Every single frame that this operates, this update node will send out a trigger and that will call the sequence node. Now a lot of stuff happens when a node gets called by a green trigger execution signal. Um, the first thing it does is it takes all of its inputs. Sequence node doesn't have those, but I'll bring that up a little later. And then it outputs its executions. Now, most of them only have one, but the sequence node is unique in that it has multiple output signals, triggers. Um, so the way that this works is they'll go in order from top to bottom. There's a couple times where this is maybe a little unclear. Um, because of some asynchronous nodes. And I'll explain that briefly. But the thing that you need to know is when you're using a visual scripting graph like this, you always want to make sure that your parts of your visual scripting subgraph or visual scripting graph are separated into the things that happen first in that frame, the next things that happen in that frame, and then the last things that happen in that frame. And you can add some more in between. As you can see, you can add as many X uh, output triggers as you want. So divide your scene as much as you need into different sections. The three common ones that I always think of are gather all of the pieces that you need. So this is where you get your references and you assign some values based on some simple calculations and then make sure everything's in place. Next step during the same frame, you'll want to put in all of the things that you'll need to calculate. So I created a subgraph that will take in all the values and make some calculations and basically spit out a bunch of results. And then in the last subgraph that you'll want, you want to assign them back to some variables or set some values on some components, do whatever you need to apply those calculations that you just did. And a lot of times this is what we call the game loop. So every single frame, it'll go through this stage of uh, getting some values, doing something with the values, and then applying those calculations that you just made with the values. The, on the only time that it will call, uh, back to the sequence node here, the only time that it'll go from calling this first uh, set of nodes to the next one is when it's finished with procedure one executions. The way that we know that it's finished with the procedure one executions is that it hits a dead end. Let's go into this subgraph here. All it's got here is an if statement. So when this if statement finishes and doesn't call a next node on here, then it returns. And when it returns to this uh, input, it will go back until it gets to sequence and then it'll notify sequence that it's done. This is common in programming and this is how uh, this is basically just a lot of my assumptions, but it's pretty solid. I'm, yeah, I'm very confident that it works like this. Um, the next thing that you'll note is that if uh, there's a, an asynchronous node, sometimes it will send a return signal early, even though it has more to do, more to send. So for example, we have this wait for seconds node. Um, it's going to want to wait for some amount of time that's much longer than the current frame. So we can't wait for that to keep going before we call the next one because the sequence node should be operating within the same frame. So if it hits an asynchronous node where it has to wait before it sends another signal, then that's considered the same thing as hitting a dead end and it will return a value during that frame saying, hey, I'm waiting for another frame, go on without me. So then that will go back and tell the sequence node, you can call the next one. This one is essentially done for this frame. Um, so that's how the sequence node basically operates. And 
You can organize your logic in a way that uh, makes sense now that you know that about the dead ends and the way that it waits for the next one to be called and the way that the second procedure is going to be called after the first procedure. So any changes that you make during this first one to values, those values will be updated to the new values when you go into the second one. So that's something to keep very clearly in mind. The last thing that I want to go over is just connecting some of these thoughts um, and showing how the if uh, node will work. Essentially, this if block, when it gets called, like I said with the sequence node, the first thing it will do is take in its inputs before it does any sort of calculation. So what it's doing here, it has this input, and it's a Boolean input. So where does it get that? Well, it'll reach back out to this greater than node, and this greater than node will want to return this Boolean value to the if. But in order for the greater than node to give that, it has to do its full operation. See, the right side is always going to be the last thing that it does. And now that this if statement is requesting a value from this greater than, this greater than is basically being called in a similar way. So the first thing it, that it will do, if you think about it, is look at its input values. So it will go back another step and it will call upon this add number and ask, what is value one? Uh, I need to know value one. So that this add node will also need to look at its inputs. So we have this weight value and it is a variable. So it doesn't have to do anything except for return the value that's stored in this. So that has no inputs, so it just returns this value. So now this add, it has its 5.0, um, it has that ready. Now it needs to get another input number, and this comes from the parameter inputs. So then we have to go outside of the graph to see that this value is going to be zero because there's no inputs. So you're basically walking through the logic until you get to a dead end, and then you have both values so you can do the calculations, and then it can return back to the greater than. So now greater than is like, okay, now I have my value, and I have this other value that has no inputs, so I can do my calculations now. So the greater than does its calculations, and it returns its value. And then we get to the back to the if, and the if is like, okay, now I've been triggered and I have my values, and it's true. So I can do my calculations and decide I'll execute the true statement. So you can basically walk through the same logic with all of the nodes that exist. And if you can get these basic thoughts going every time that you work on a graph, uh, you'll be able to think through the logic much more clearly and make much more complex things. And uh, bring all of your visions to life. Hopefully this was helpful and I hope that uh, anybody who uses this could make some really awesome stuff. Good luck!